We hope that you enjoy this message. For additional talks, please visit abcchurch.com. Take out your Bibles and your sermon outlines, and let's pray before we study God's Word as well. Lord, thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you that we get to live in God's country, Colorado Springs. And Lord, thank you for the church that we're sitting in right now and the freedom of religion that we have. And Lord, over the next few minutes, we just ask for something incredible to happen in our hearts because we're into your word and studying it, and the Holy Spirit does something amazing with that to just breathe new life into our bones. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Two women were walking through the woods, and a frog jumped out in front of them. That was scary enough, but then the frog started talking. The frog goes, help me, ladies. I'm actually a wealthy real estate investor, and a witch put a spell on me and turned me into a frog. The ladies were like, well, that's really sad. He goes, wait, no, no. If one of you will kiss me, I will turn back into the wealthy investor, and then I'll marry you. Well, one of the ladies reaches down, grabs the frog, holds it up and looks at it. He thinks, wow, we're about to be kissed. The spell will be over. She stuffs the frog in her purse. The other lady goes, what'd you put it in your purse for? He's a wealthy real estate investor. Kiss the frog. She goes, oh no, these days a talking frog will make a lot more money than a wealthy real estate investor. (laughs) That's probably true, right? (laughs) Well, I want to talk to you today about making good decisions. I have good news for you. When you become a Christ follower and you're being led by the Holy Spirit, you have big help for big decisions in your life. Isaiah 30 verse 21 gives us some insight into how God will lead in our decisions. It's up on the screen and also in your outline. Let's read this out loud together. Would you read it with me? Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. I heard about this personnel manager who advertised for a job opening and a large group of applicants were sitting in her waiting room and the first young man was ushered into her office and she began explaining the job to him. She said, we need someone in this job who can make fast decisions. She continued to see that this position requires someone who can really think on their feet. Can you show me that you are capable of that? Without a word, the young man leaped to his feet. He stuck his head out the door into the waiting room and he announced to everyone who was waiting, the applicants, he said, all right, all you people can go home. The job's just been filled. (laughs) In other words, he was assuming he had the job. (laughs) Think fast. Okay, next service, I won't use that one. Oh, wait, we don't have another service. Okay, well, anyway. How many agree that was a risky decision to just say, I got the job that way? Okay, well. We are going to pick up our study of an Old Testament prophet named Gideon. I plan to show you how important this story is even for our current events in the world right now. You may remember from last time, two weeks ago, Gideon did not exactly graduate from the school of leadership. (laughs) When the Lord gave him a task to do, what did he do? He said, I'm the least in my family. My family is the least in the tribe of Manasseh. He just gave all these examples. You know, you can almost hear him whining. I can't do this job. But God saw past his weakness to say, I see an amazing future for you to lead Israel in this moment. Jesus focuses on our potential, not our past. Is anybody glad about that today? He focuses on your potential. He looks forward to the future. So, We're going to walk through this story verse by verse. I think you'll see, how does Jesus lead me to make good decisions? Number one in your outline, he gives me his peace about my decisions. So if you have your Bible handy, turn to Judges chapter 6. So two weeks ago, when we started talking about Gideon, we saw that God basically came to him and recruited him. He found him in a wine press threshing wheat, which is hilarious because there's no wind to thresh wheat in a wine press. And he addressed him, God bless you, mighty warrior, you know, and Gideon, you are a mighty warrior. And he was nothing of the sort. But now through several events that happened that we studied last time, Gideon has now realized God wants him to deliver Israel from the oppression of an enemy nation. 
This enemy nation is the Midianites. The Midianites were famous for how brutal they were. The way they attacked nations was known as scorched earth. They burned everything to the ground. They killed everybody except anybody they wanted and any plunder they wanted. They left it completely decimated. They had struck fear into the entire world in the Middle East at that time. And they are now approaching Israel. Israel has become weak because they've been worshiping false gods. So we're going to continue Gideon's story, and we read this verse last time, so I want to remind you of it this time as well. In verse 24, it says, So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. Now, if you were reading in a Hebrew Bible, it would say, Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. And it goes on to say, To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abizarites. Jesus will guide you in major decisions by giving you a feeling of peace. Sometimes when you make a decision, you might be troubled or anxious. You make a decision, then you can't sleep all night. Did you know God is using that to tell you, hey, maybe that's not the right decision? Has that happened to anybody? You say, oh, I feel a peace about that decision. Or sometimes you go, I just can't get peace about that decision. God uses that. When our kids, Josh and Chrissy, were younger, we drove out to California one time and we had a conference to attend and we needed somebody to watch the kids. They were younger while we went to this conference. So we brought a girl named Michelle with us. We had known her since she was 10 years old and now she's the kids director for North Texas District of the Assemblies of God. So we're so proud of Michelle. We called her Mickey back then. Well, Mickey has been uh, coaching Annie, our children's director. She actually works with Annie uh, via long distance and calls and Zoom calls. So anyway, on the first day we get to California, we give Mickey our keys to our minivan and we say, hey, take the kids, here's some money for lunch and stuff. And we say, go have fun, you know, we're gonna be at this conference. So they go to the beach and they were swimming at the beach and they discovered these hermit crabs on the beach there in Southern California. So our college student, Mickey, Brought, bought a plastic bucket to get some of those hermit crabs for the kids. So they're just filling this basket full of hermit crabs. How many know where this story is going, maybe? And so they decided to bring the bucket of crabs back to the hotel room. Interesting. And so <laughs> the kids asked Dad, where's the lid? Because the crabs were trying to climb out of said bucket. And Sandy did not like that aspect. But I noticed something, they never got out of the bucket. It was very interesting to look down that bucket because the crabs, they're all crammed in there, you know, and so they would get on top of each other and you'd see them and they're like, oh, that one is going to get out. And about the time one of those crabs is like, he's going to make a jailbreak. He's got one claw on the edge. Do you know what happened? The rest of the crabs would pull him down. They're like, you ain't getting out of here if we ain't getting out of here. They would pull their crabby friend back down into the bucket. There is a lot of people who are like crabs. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> if I ain't getting out of this problem, you ain't getting out of this problem. I don't want to be a crabby Christian. How about you? I want to be a Christian that lifts people up to get out of the bucket. I want to be a Christian that is at peace in my life. By the way, the next morning we woke up in the hotel room. It smelled so bad. It smelled like dead fish. Oh, it was so bad. We woke up, we're like, what is that? It's the smell of death. They had died trying to hold each other in the bucket, grabbing each other their claws, you know, pulling each other down. And I just thought, you know what? There are some people who are dying to hold you back. How many met people like that? Dying to hold you back. Instead of always being agitated and troubled and accusing people and attacking and believing the worst about people, be a godly leader. Be a person of peace like Jesus was. Christians are people full of peace, amen? What kind of peace am I talking about? I'm so glad you asked. John chapter 14, verse 2. Jesus said these words, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. 
do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. How many think we could use a little more of that right now? <laughs> yeah. So Jesus guides you, number one, with peace when you're making a big decision. He'll give you a feeling of peace. Number two, he wants me to be an agent of forgiveness. Do you know we all need forgiveness? We all need forgiveness. Is there anybody here who's pretty sure you've already committed a sin since you woke up this morning? And if you don't think you have, you probably just have a bad memory. <laughs> we all need forgiveness every day. We have to swim in an ocean of forgiveness. When Jesus died on the cross for us, that's what we got. We get to swim in an ocean of his constant forgiveness. So here we go, picking up our story, verse 25. Then that same night, the Lord said to him, Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal, and cut down the Asherah pole beside it, then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height, using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down. Offer the second bull as a burnt offering. Gideon's first task as God's mighty man of valor is to destroy idol worship. He has the job of cleaning house. Why? First commandment, God issued in the Ten Commandments, numero uno is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Israel was breaking that in the worst way. When it talks about the Baal altar and it talks about the Asherah pole, these were pagan practices worshiping these horrible, evil, wicked, pagan gods. In fact, the worship could be best described as a horrific orgy of sacrifice. There were sexual overtones with it. It was done on high places. People went up to the mountains and horrible things happened there. Now, it says the second bull. Gideon's first bull we read about last time when he atoned for his sins. The second bull, God's taking him another step. He said, now you need to atone for the sins of the people, the other Israelites. So when Jesus asked Gideon to do this, it violated Old Testament law for burnt offerings. This is so interesting. Gideon was not a priest. Priests had to burn the specific uh, offering that was required. They had to be from a specific bloodline. Only a priest could atone for the people's sins with a burnt offering. But here God asked Gideon to serve as a priest so the people can be forgiven. Why was this so urgent? Because God said, Gideon, you're my man. You're my mighty warrior. You're going to lead Israel in defeating the Midianites. Israel, not really a battle-proven entity, is going up against these scorched earth guys. This is serious. And God goes, you know what? You got to stop the idol worship. You got to clean house. Now, the false gods mentioned were Baal and Asher. I want to talk about this for just a second. Jonathan Kahn is a messianic Jewish rabbi. He actually wrote a book about this, about these ancient false gods. And it's called The Return of the Gods. And Rabbi Khan says these false gods may have even returned to the United States. See, what made the United States such a unique country, I'm not sure they teach us anymore, but what it made it such a unique country was we were founded on godly biblical principles. How many have ever been to Washington, D.C.? If you've been there and you've toured anything there, you know that's true, don't you? In the House of Representatives, do you know what's up in the front? The Ten Commandments. Moses holding them at the very front, up high in the balcony. Scripture is written all the way around the House of Representatives. Do you think they've been conducting godly business all the time lately? Mm. The Washington Monument. If you go to the very top of the Washington Monument and you look around inside of it, it has scriptures written on it. And the very top has an inscription, Sole Deo Gloria, to God be the glory. 
It is everywhere in Washington, D.C. because that's how our country was started on godly principles. That's what made our nation great. That's why we were a beacon into dark places all around the world because we were a godly country. When, what made the United States such a breath of fresh air, such a beacon of light was the nation was formed for this. The USA was set free from dark spiritual principalities that were ruling many other countries, and we were a godly nation. The only way the evil spirits could come into the United States, Molech and Baal and Asherah, was if people turned away from God. Sadly, people in America have turned away from God. They did a survey recently after COVID. They said 73% of people who were attending prior to COVID say they either watch online or don't go at all. So Baal, do you know what Baal's main mission is? Baal, the false god Baal, all the way back from ancient Bible times, the, the, the mission of Baal, his strategy is to separate a nation from the word of God and the ways of God. That's what he's known for. He's a false God who says, Jehovah God is not any help to you. Don't study Jehovah God's word. You say, where do you get that? How many remember the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel? Elijah was one prophet for Jehovah God. There were 400 other prophets for Baal. And Elijah had a showdown. It was such an awesome story. He said, okay, I'll make an altar to my God, and whoever lights the altar, you make an altar for your God, Baal, and whoever lights up the sacrifice with fire from heaven, that's the true God. Anybody remember this story? Yeah, so what happened? Baal went first. He said, you guys go first. And they danced around their altar, and they cried. They even cut themselves. And, oh, Baal, light our altar on fire. Not a spark. Not a little mass stick of light. No fire, nothing. And then Elijah goes, excuse me. I am here to represent the one true God, the almighty God, Jehovah God. He goes, I need some water. Pour it all over the wood. Pour it all over the sacrifice. He poured so much water on us, running over the altar and running into uh, stuff all around the altar. It's a sopping wet mess. And then Elijah just prays, oh God, show him. And fire came down from heaven and consumed that altar and burned. It's the only time I've ever heard something called, it licked up the water. How many want to see some fire lick up some water? God goes, here, watch this. Licky, licky, licky. All around the water. <laughs> and then he goes, kill him. All those false prophets of Baal who have been leading the people astray, kill him. And they did. Oh, it was a victory like none other. That's the Baal we're talking about. Baal causes a nation to turn away from God. His strategy is to separate a nation from the word. In America, Baal went after our kids. Started in 1962. No more prayer in school. That was a long time ago now. 60 years of no prayer in school for our kids. Children were taught to not believe in God. That's a fairy tale. Actually, what you need to believe is in science. A lot of this isn't in my notes, so I don't know what's going on right at the moment, but <laughs> are you okay? Okay, I'll keep going. Asher is known as Mrs. Baal. Demonic spirits intertwined. Mrs. Baal. Baal and Asherah are linked together. Asherah is the false god who destroys marriages. And the way she likes to destroy marriages is lust and pornea, which is where we get our word pornography, and perverting of sex. Anybody think perhaps she's at work in America? Oh, Dear Lord. There's another side to Asherah. She's also called Ashtora. She's also called Ishtar. But one of the interesting labels she's given is the Transformer. Ashtora 
the transformer, Asherah the transformer. Listen to this, you won't believe it. Asherah as the transformer is the false god who changes man to woman and woman to man by altering human desire, identity, and nature itself. Whoa. There's another false god in Gideon's time, although this false god is not mentioned in this particular story. It's the false evil god of Molech. Molech might be the most hideous of them all because Molech is the false god in this time when Gideon was alive who may have, and these are false demonic spirits, so they do not die. They just go out into the desert when they can't inhabit anything or any nation or any person, and then they come back in. Molech is the god of sacrifice of human beings, especially children and babies. And that is an abomination to God. When God starts a life in the womb, it is an abomination to God that a nation allows it because that means the nation has let the God of, false God of Molech in. How many of you just realized that Gideon was tearing down altars to the same evil spirits the United States needs to tear down altars to? Isn't that incredible? The same evil spirits that are coming against our country. And you wonder why a lot of people go, what's going on? Why is this so crazy? People are just, what is going on? I love right now that a lot more people are starting to say, what is going on? How come there's all these derailments and poisonous gases being released? And how, why are all these things happening? It's because we are under attack by these evil things that we have let into our country. And that is going to require revival. Amen. It's going to require repentance before revival and restoration can happen. You have, repentance is a godly sorrow for your sins. Why? Because it's important for Christians to remember, you can't stand against these false gods. You go, well, let me at them. I'll take them out. No, you can't. They'll take you out. Unless, here's the thing. You can't stand against these false gods and also be in bondage to them. There's a phrase, sleeping with the enemy. You can't be sleeping with the enemy. You have to renounce all these false gods if they have a hold on your life. Remember, Jesus once said something shocking. He said, if your eye causes you to sin, cut it out. Did he mean that literally? No. What he meant was do whatever you have to do to keep yourself from sinning. And if that means you have to completely go, I'm not going to be involved in that, then do it. You must renounce all these false gods and any hold they have on your life. There's only one antidote to these horrific, evil, false gods that still could be influencing our nation. There's only one power strong enough to overcome these ancient false gods, and that is... Jesus Christ, the Son of God who defeated Satan. Can you say amen to that? He's the only one. But that's all you need. That's all you need. Have you ever heard people say, Jesus, Jesus, like they get into a situation, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's because there is power in the name of Jesus. So if you want to experience it, you go, Pastor Lee, where are you going with this? <laughs> Remember I said be an agent of forgiveness. If you want to experience God's forgiveness, it just starts with repentance. And you say, what does repentance really mean? It's the Greek word metanoia, which means to make a 180. You just go, you know what? I've been walking this way my whole life. I'm turning completely around. I am going to make a 180 in the totally different direction. Jesus has an extravagant love for you. Don't let anybody condemn you. And tell you you aren't worth anything. And you're lost. And you're a sinner. And you're a horrible liar, awful person after, after you've committed your life to Christ. Now, if you haven't, yes, that's all true. <laughs> you're a liar. You're a sinner. And you need Jesus. But as soon as you commit your life to Christ, there is therefore Romans 8.1. Now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How many love Romans 8.1? The minute you get saved, then Jesus goes, we're done with the condemning part. Now you are my son, you are my daughter, you are a son and daughter of the king. Woo! Good Lord. Is it noon now or something? I feel like I've been preaching a long time without the notes. Are you okay? 
So maybe it's me reading about the Asbury Seminary Revival. Have you heard the stories about that? Yeah. Revival broke out at the Asbury Seminary in Wilt or Wilmore, Kentucky. It's today, it's on its 12th day. 12 days. They finally had to stop the 24-7 thing because, you know, I mean, how many know a building can start to smell a little funny if people are in there 24-7 for, you know, a week? It's going to smell like bologna and sneakers or something. Thousands of people around the country, even the world, are now making a pilgrimage to this little town of Wilmore, Kentucky, because they have such a hunger and such high hopes of encountering more of God. That's why they're going there. I have a friend, pastor friend, who actually did a seminary degree there, and he went there this week. The revival is now officially an overflow with a mile long of people waiting to see if they can get in. And if they don't get in, they just camp out because the next day maybe they'll get in. CBN News spoke with people from all over the country who are waiting patiently to get into Hughes Auditorium where this revival broke out so they could experience revival for themselves. And they say revival is already spread to a seminary in Ohio. It's uh, spread to a place in Michigan, I believe. And it's starting to break out. Do you know most of the great awakenings, most of the revivals in the history of the United States broke out in colleges and with young people? Oh, Lord, let it rip. Let it rip. America needs to be driven to their knees. And if we don't do it soon, God's going to make it happen. So that's what Gideon did. Our man Gideon. Do you see how I brought that sucker all the way back around to Gideon? (laughs) Some of you are worried this is the sermon that will never end, but I promise it hasn't ended (laughs) Gideon launched a revival. How did he do it? He tore down the idol worship. He tore down the false prophets' worship, their altars, their Asherah poles. And that caused God to forgive Israel. Do you see? We pray that, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will come and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That means you've got to get on your knees and Ask for forgiveness and repent of your sins. You don't get to jump to the heal the land part. God says, and then, if you do that, then I will heal your land. So that caused what Gideon did. He said, I'm going up there and I'm tearing that place down. That caused God to give Israel forgiveness for their sins as a nation God, to rescue Israel from the oncoming horde that's about to invade them. It's not there yet, but they scorched earth is one mountain away, coming at them. When people cry out to Jesus for him to rescue America, it starts with repentance for our sins. And you individually can repent of your sins and be forgiven and know that you're going to heaven whether scorched earth happens or not. How many are so glad about that? (laughs) You know, we have to remind ourselves, this is not our home. Heaven is our home. We're stuck in this mess until we get there. I promise you, anybody listening, watching, heaven will be so good, you will wish you had not eaten bran muffins all your life to make yourself regular. You'd be like, I should have just enjoyed myself and ate whatever so I could have gone to heaven earlier. You're going to get up there and go, why did we try to prolong life on earth? Good Lord, we could have been here 10 years earlier. I'm just kidding you a little bit, but you know what I'm saying? (laughs) All right, number three. We only have eight points, so look at that. We're already on number three. It goes faster, don't worry. So Jesus guides me by number three. He helps me know when to be discreet. Oh, this is good. Verse 27, so Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. Oh, there's a smart man right there. He's used to hiding. He was hiding in the wine press, remember? He's like, I ain't going to go do this in the middle of the day. Boys, we're doing stealth. We're doing James Bond. We're doing double agent 007. He sets out to tear down the altar to Baal. 
and build one up for the true God. He goes, you know what? Let's do this at night so we'll be able to finish the task and not get speared before we're done. He loved that. He went at night. You know, sometimes good things need to take place at night. Anybody agree? Like prayer. If the Lord wakes you up at 2 in the morning or 3 in the morning and you can't sleep, give that about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, maybe 30 on the outside, and then that's when you go, I must need to get up and pray. When you wake up in the middle of the night as a Christian, you have to say, I must need to pray for someone, something. Jesus told us that we have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. When we are sent out, he said, I'm sending you out amongst wolves. So you're going to be harmless as a dove. Wise as a serpent. All right, number four. He shows me resistance means I'm on track. All right, verse 20, what? Eight. In the morning when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told Gideon, son of Joash, did it. The people of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son, he must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. You know what? When you take a stand for God, guess what? The opposition gets mad, don't they? We can see it in our country. This town is not delighted that Gail, uh, Gideon started uh, restored worship to Jehovah God. They're mad about it. Their disobedience got exposed. They went up on the mountain so nobody could see it. We may think, here's what I want to tell you today. You may think when God's attack, oh, your arms, I'm under attack. Huh? Have you ever heard people say that? Oh, man, I've been under attack. Lord, oh, dear Jesus, I'm under attack. Lord, spare me from this attack that's happening. I'm being attacked. Do you know what? I want to maybe give you a little idea there. When you're being attacked, it sometimes means you're on the right track. Just remember that. If you're being attacked, sometimes you're on the right track. Can you say that with me? I'm being attacked. I'm on the right track. Because we think being in God's will makes it easy. No. When you're in God's will, Satan goes, oh, no. There goes that Isaac being a force for God in the community. Launch some attacks on him. There goes Susie. Witnessing to her friends in school. Oh no, attack her and her family. See, when the darkness is exposed, you'll feel the resistance, the pushback. And that's when you could say, I must be on the right track. <laughs> I'm getting attacked. You can be encouraged knowing you're on the right track. Resistance feels like a personal attack, but start to look at it as a personal assurance from God in your decisions. Another way God guides me for a decision. Number five, he asks me to let him defend and protect me. So they're saying Gideon must die. Bring him out here. He's got to die. Verse 31, but Joash, the dad, don't you love a great dad? Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, are you going to plead Baal's case? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. How many think that's a pretty good defense right there? Verse 32, so because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jeroboam that day, saying, let Baal contend with him. You know what they're saying? They're going, oh, Baal will take care of Gideon. Have no doubt. No. No, Jehovah God is with Gideon. Baal, you ain't nothing. Just go away. Gideon's dad, Joy, says, if, Ge if Baal's a real God, he can defend himself. I love that Gideon does not have to say a word. When you get attacked by people, the best thing you can do is just zip. The quieter you are, the better. What's that old proverb? Better to be silent and thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. <laughs> Trust God to defend you from the attack. He will do it better than you ever could. 
And number six, he sends the Holy Spirit's power to help me. Continue on in verse 33. Now all the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern people joined forces. Oh, no. It was just the Midianites before. So now the Amalekites, who are not nice people either, and other eastern people joined forces. They're coming after Israel. So it got worse. Going on, it says, and they crossed over the Jordan and they camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abizarites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to her arms and also into Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali so that they too went up to meet them. So this is an epic battle that is shaping up. The enemies camped out just away from Israel. You recall that Gideon was the weakest and the least in his family. Gideon calls his townspeople, his fellow Israelites, to join him. He blows the trumpet. The Spirit of the Lord came on him. Woo! Some of the people are ready to kill him. And now they're ready to die with him? Isn't it amazing what God can do? The people who are mad at you suddenly go, he blew the trumpet, it's time to go with him. Let's go help him. Do you realize what happened? Those people are like, how dare you? You cut down our Baal worship center. You deserve to die. And the Holy Spirit comes on Gideon, and he blows the trumpet, and he goes, who's with me? We're going to go fight. And those same people go, we're with you. <laughs> Only God could do that. Take the people attacking you and go, you know what? I, I, I don't know why, but I think I'm going to help you. <laughs> I'm going to help you. What caused his enemies to become comrades? What changed their hearts from idolatry back to God? I love it. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. The Holy Spirit empowered Gideon to be a mighty man of valor. That was the difference. You say, oh man, I wish I had that kind of influence. I wish I had that kind of power. I wish I could do something like that. Well, 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, 3, says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? You got it. Be bold. The same spirit that rested on Gideon dwells inside of us and gives us supernatural power too. How many think we forget about how much power we have sometimes? Three of you, how many, how many think we forget? Reminds me of this farmer. He was standing out in the middle of his field, and another farmer drove by in his pickup truck, and he stopped, and he goes, what you doing? The farmer answered, I'm trying to win the Nobel Peace Prize. The other farmer goes, what? How, how in tarnation are you going to do that? The farmer replied, he said, well, I read the rules. It says you've got to be outstanding in your field. <laughs> I just tried to lighten you up a little. You're all looking at me all serious. You want to stand out? Be in a field agent for God. Amen? All right, here we come. Number seven, number eight, only two more points. Number seven, he leads me with signs to guide me. Oh, this is such a great story. I love the story of Gideon, verse 36. Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised... Look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose up early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Gideon is unsure, so he asks for a sign, a fleece. He says, hey, I want there to be dew on the fleece, but not on the ground around it. He's like, God, if you're really going to do this, if you're really going to perform what you've told me, the wool fleece from the sheep will be wet, ground will be dry around it. Have you ever felt confused? When God asks you to do something, you're God, Lord, Really? I'm not sure about taking that next step. Gideon's way was saying, God, I'm not sure. And God says, you know what? I understand. 
Oh, thank you, Jesus, for understanding when we're scared to move forward. We're not sure when we go, I'm not sure. Lord, is that really you? And lastly, to make good decisions. Make sure you always remember this. Number eight, he is patient with me and never gives up on me. Oh, isn't that words to the heart right there? Verse 39, (laughs) then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece, but this time make the fleece dry and the ground around me covered with dew. That night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. Gideon was actually worried. He's like, I am pushing it right here. (laughs) God's going to strike me with a lightning bolt at this point. He's going, hey, can you reverse it? Dry fleece, wet ground. I love this story in the Bible because you can see God's love and patience. Love and and patience. He does not get mad at Gideon. He keeps working with him. And just think for a second. Gideon is about to go into a military battle where the percentage of success is zero. The Midianites don't lose. They must have used flamethrowers or something. They just burn it to the ground. Zero percent chance of winning. Then he goes and tears down the false idols, the worship center for Baal and Ashtoreth, and use has the audacity, the unmitigated gall to use what they were worshiping their false gods with as kindling for the sacrifice to Jehovah God. How many think that's kind of cool? But wouldn't you feel just a little insecure? <laughs> just. A, His mind is probably racing. He's like, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. (laughs) The Midianites. And Gideon's like, God, I'm so sorry, but I just need to know it's you. Do you know God loves that prayer? God loves that prayer. Lord, I just got to know it's you. I got to know. I got to know it's you. That desperate prayer that says, God, I got to know. I'm afraid. There's people who think I'm crazy. There's people coming after me. When Gideon asked a second time for God to do the reverse, do you know what that was? He goes, well, I saw the first sign. The The fleece was wet. It takes a supernatural thing to reverse it. To make the fleece be dry and the ground around it be wet. Because you're reversing whatever worked on the first one, you're reversing it. That means only God can reverse nature to make it do the opposite thing. He was saying, Lord, I need a sign that only an almighty God could do. I need to know it wasn't coincidence. He needed to know God had his back. He had to know the battle is the Lord's. And next week, we're going to continue on with this story, and you'll see why it was a good thing God told Gideon this, because it gets crazier. I don't know what battle you're facing. Maybe you have a decision ahead of you. But the Lord never gives up on you. He never gives up on you. He never goes, well, you know, you've just gone too far this time. He never gives up on you. You might. You might walk away. You might forget the Lord, but he never gives up. He chases after you. You're the pearl of great price. He will lovingly guide you in your decisions if you ask him. Would you bow your heads and pray with me, please? Father, you know the decisions that we all have different ones in our lives. We're all facing decisions all the time. And Jesus, we know how much you love us. We love you so much. Would you just make sure you wrap your arms around us, Jesus, so we know how much you love us? We know your Holy Spirit will guide us. Please, Jesus, guide us by giving us your peace. 
Be our defender and protector from those who want to destroy us. Even some Christians, maybe. And we repent of the false gods and the evil things that maybe we have let creep into our lives. Let us tear down those altars. And if you haven't taken the step of giving your life to Jesus, just you can do that right now. It's a conversation between you and God. It doesn't even have to be out loud because God knows your every thought. He sees you right where you're sitting, whether it's online or here in the auditorium. You could just pray something like this. Jesus, I hereby repent of my sin. I need a Savior. And Jesus, I believe you are the Savior. You lived a perfect life. You died on the cross to pay the debt for my sins. And then three days later, you rose from the dead. You are the Son of God. I believe that. So I, I accept. I accept your forgiveness for my sins. Would you make a reservation for me in heaven? Because heaven's now my home. That's where I'm headed. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life talking about you and learning about you. I'm all in. And Father, we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you've enjoyed this message. For additional talks, please visit abcchurch.com.